Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, whenever you're able to tune into this episode of In Conversation with. My name is Dave Sleet, and I'm co founder of ANA Psychological Accreditation. And I'm joined today, and I'm delighted to be joined by our CEO, Siobhan Crosby. Siobhan, thank you for sharing this time with us. I'm very happy to be here. And our guest today is Derek McKenzie. Hi. Derek, good afternoon. How are you? Good afternoon. Well, um, I'm, I'm, and in a good way, I'm quite anxious about being here. And I don't mean the medical idea of anxiousness. It's just that I think anxiety in terms I've chosen to actually do this. Mm -hmm. I chose not to do it and and so it's big it's big for me and I, and I suppose in all honesty it's the privilege um one that I couldn't foresee you know how did I get here you know sort of thing you know so it's it's really yeah. nice to be here um and well, for you to invite me to speak and um, and we're, we're absolutely delighted to be able to share with the audience a little bit more about how you got here um, and a little bit more about what you do and the, the focus that you have. Um, and Siobhan, this was a conversation that you, you have driven to, to come to be. And I think for a lot of people that have followed the In Conversation With series, We've spoken to members, we've spoken to non-members, we've spoken to professionals and non-professionals. But why in particular did you want to drive this conversation um, before we open up um, with, with Derek on, on exactly what he's going to be sharing with us today? Okay, well firstly, Derek happens to work in a building next door to me doesn't live too far away from me. I can't actually on the spot even remember how we ended up connecting. I think it was probably through LinkedIn. I picked up on something. I'm sure that's what it was. And when I pick up on intelligence and when I pick up on somebody that I want to know better, I want to know what's in their head. I want to know how they got where they got to. I decided to reach out to Derek. I'm sure that's how it worked. Um, went for a couple of coffees with him and got to know got to understand things from his perception of his journey and I just was so I'm not often shocked but I, I was shocked by some of the things that Derek shared with me over the history of mental health and dynamics but today is very much about me wanting to share Derek. Derek knows his stuff, he's smart and I love what he has to say. And from my perspective, when I love what somebody has to say, I want other people to hear what Derek has to say because his story is incredible. And for me personally, that's a story that needs to be aired, needs to be shared. Derek needs to be known because to know Derek, I will personally call Derek not just a colleague or a peer. I now genuinely after a couple of coffees, consider him somebody that would grow into a really, really great friendship. And that for me, when I hear somebody that's smart and knows his stuff, it is, it's an honour for me. So I really wanted Derek to be here and I wanted to share Derek with as many people as Appa can possibly share. <laughs> so that's my reason. So Derek, I'm going to come to you. Um, I want you just to share your life, how you got here. Just go with the flow. Let me hear how you got here. Let David hear and let the world hear. This, I think for whoever's listening, this has not been, I've not wrote a script. The way it's come about, it's been quite immediate. And so nothing I say, I've thought about, you know, so I really want you to know that. And I think it's really lovely to hear what you have to, have to say about me uh, one. So thank you for that. Let me kind of work from where I am now and go backwards. Um, 
a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, I I was invited to um, to give a talk at a particular university as a guest speaker. It's the first time I ever spoke. You know, I've since grown into, you know, someone that isn't as shy as I thought I once was as a kid. And, um, but I think, you know, the honor of being asked to do that was, it was huge for me. It was huge. When we start to, when I start to look at my background and where I come from, and one of the things, the feedback, and I've got it here in front of me, I just pulled it out as we, we were speaking. One of the things that on the evaluation form that someone sent to me, and you know, it was something that wasn't in my my mind or thinking. I turn 60 next year. You know, I just turned 59. Next year I'll be 60 years old. And one of the things that this person wrote, if I can read it, she says, I didn't have a chance to thank Derek for sharing his experiences with us. I'm very aware that what I have and where I am, because I have, where I am is because I benefited from Derek and his generation, what they did for me. Living with open hostility and hatred personally and systemic, and the fact that they stood up to fight in situations like the race protest in the 1980s means that, a, that life has been a little better for me, but I am aware that what was overly shouted at us is now co co covertly thought about. As Derek said, he knows where he is with openly racist people and then more, lib and then more the liberal type of racism seen in white middle class. And, and, and I was really moved by that um I, I really had a sense of hope you know that there were individuals white clinical psychologists you know at the top of their their field were willing to have that conversation but it would but that it reminded me, I often talk about when I've written some of my, my essays, and I grew up in a time that, that it, it was obvious, you could see it in most social places, no dogs, no blacks, no Irish. You know, I was a young kid that was a bit of a wild kid, and I used to stay out, you know, as a six-year-old and run about with, with some of the adults on the estate. And, you know, my mum couldn't, she couldn't contain me, and she used to say, get in before it goes dark. And I remember going home, you know, when it was dark, because I stayed out, opening the letterbox and the door just opening. You know, there's a there's a story to that as well, right? Because, you know, she had a way of disciplining me and it got really tricky uh, um, at times. So I grew up at that time. I think that was also in my school. You know, that was evident in my school. I remember going through school, primary school, and feeling so alone and wanting to learn, but being scorned at, you know, just through a look of the teacher as though I was, you know, some kind of something quite dirty. And I suppose from that, I thought that this isn't a place for me. You know, so that went on for a while. I went into different directions. You know, I, I couldn't get into school. I remember going to secondary school, wanting to go to a particular school, thinking that, you know, if I go to, which again, I'm sure it would have been worse or as bad. I wanted to go to a, a Roman Catholic school, but I couldn't get in because I hadn't gone to church enough. And so I just followed where all my friends went. And, you know, I spent time in school being suspended, getting the cane, being up the shed, playing penny up, smoking weed. Because, you know, I, I, I started to smoke weed from a ten, as a 10-year-old, you know. And so, you know, and that progressed. You know, taking substances, as we know, it's, I believe anyway, as young people, we experiment. But some of us don't leave that experimentation, you know, experiential uh, side of things. I was one of them. I stayed and 
the substances got, you know, in class went up and up. Um, and came with that was a certain lifestyle that led me to different places and one of the places it led me to was what I jokingly call one of Her Majesty's hotels you know when I think about it now you know we think about research and about how you know there is a prisons that are overpopulated with people of black African descent specifically males mm. So I became a yet another uh, uh, statistic, mm. you know. So let me let me let me ask a question on that um, because I think a lot of people will generally accept that as human beings we like to prove ourselves right whatever our opinion or our thought process is we will operate with an operational bias to that thought so if we think something we're going to look for the evidence to prove that we're right mm. do you think that educational entrapment if you like is the institutionalization of that self-fulfilling prophecy that the the authorities or those in positions of decision making are there exerting their own self-fulfilling prophecy there is something about buying into whatever is put out you know, in a in simplistic term. Mm. And I think, you know, our minds are so, is it meanable that we're always looking for something? You know, I think, and you ask that on the back of what I said, and, I, and I'm not sure of the question, so I'm going to, that you're asking there. Um, But I think that, you know, I was, you know, on the back of or saying that I was a, st a statistic, I believe I was pushed into a particular position. And, and you know, I suppose if my parents or parent was in a position to somehow resist, resist, Eurocentric ideas about what it means to be human, mm. i.e., black, non-human. If they were able to to resist that and instill those values in me, then I probably would have had a better chance. Mm. That's my fault. I, I think I would have had a better chance. But you know, we're poor. Um, my mother, you know, I'm the first person to go on and get a degree in my family, mm. and probably. Only my daughter has, you know, and she's 40. Yeah, in mm. the whole family, I think. You know, i got to think about my nieces and nephews, but that's what I do know. So I think we are conditioned. I really do. Mm. And, you know, which I will come to is evident within psychotherapy training. And that's exactly where I was leading to. And as you say, that 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 conditioning, and another word for that is grooming. Yeah. And when you have that Eurocentric mindset, and it's been there for now centuries, there's centuries of grooming that's gone on. That bias, that operational bias to create the environment or as some would say we create the conditions for the outcome we want mm. when that has been in place for centuries that desire for a parent to be able to resist mm. has almost not quite but it's almost been groomed out of existence yeah there's a crisis at the moment, and I don't know if you're aware, but, you know, it's always been there, but it appears to be quite, 
becoming quite louder at the moment because, you know, you hear it in Roads Must Fall, you hear it in Decolonising the Curriculum, you hear it in, the, you know, for myself, trying to unlearn what I, I've learned. So in, in, in a sense, decolonise my own mind. Mm. Um you know, you hear it in why why is why isn't my professor black? You know, and you know, although there's a lot of resistance to this change, since the murder of George Floyd, the televised murder of in, in, in of George Floyd, there has been what I would say a reaction rather than a response, because I didn't just appear. You know, a person of my heritage, I have not just appeared. Mm. But it's almost as though there was an opening up of people's eyes of what I and the, the likes of myself or the other are holding on to, as the, I think it was the UKCP said, what we've been holding on for a long while. But I think it's been a reaction. But at the moment, for me, there's a buzz of, at the moment where institutions are thinking about change, but I don't know if it's going to be followed with sustainable action. Yeah. And Derek, <laughs> Siobhan, I know, I know you're, you are going to come in on what, what Derek's just said. But do you think that, that that drive for change, and App has always argued against the, the concept of change, but argued for evolution. But do you think that that fight between reaction and response is something that the world of therapy has almost held itself back from over the years. If I'm honest with you, when I listen to Derek, my mind just goes a little bit alive because I'm really taking on board what you're saying, but I'm also taking on board what you're asking me. Because having an Irish history, I can really identify. My mother was rejected from environments because of being Irish and my father being in the army. But I've also worked in PIE units and schools as teaching assistants. And I have found it, and it really, I think Derek touches a core in me with the memories that I have, because I've worked with young black boys in particular, that I'm horrified at them being 16 and having been completely abandoned by systems, not diagnosed, for example, with dyslexia, you know, feeling so frustrated and inadequate in a classroom and playing and acting that out. And on the back of that being labelled and on the back of that being dismissed and on the back of that being ignored and on the back of that a 16 year old, I'm thinking of a young lad in, in my head and I wasn't working with him as a therapist so there was no breaching here that couldn't read or write at 16. He was on the verge of leaving school. And it, it, it's become a bit of an affinity for me because I worked in a PIU unit where I could take these youngsters physically out. So I would take this young lad out and play pool with him, play snooker with him. Sounds a lifetime ago and I had a great time with him. But the perception of him as a collective by the institutions was, in my opinion, horrendous. But my interactions with him and the way he was as a human being and my ability to relate to him as a human being, you wouldn't have ever thought that this youngster would have done the things that he had done because he had acted out his behaviour, he had acted out his frustration, he had acted out his dismissal, he had acted out those, that sense of shame. So when I listen to Derek, that's, that's where my head goes, that that was only 20 years ago working in a PIU unit. It was literally in my training as a therapist. So I almost hear when Derek talks, it reminds me of those youngsters that I worked with. And on a personal level, they were the nicest youngsters. As long as you respected them and cared about them, you would never have thought that they would have been committing the acts of criminal activity that they were committing at that time, simply on the basis of being dismissed because, in my opinion, they were black, nobody really cared, 
They had a problem, dyslexia, not diagnosed. Nobody cared. And to see that breaks my heart. So when I hear Derek, that's where my head goes. And I don't know what you think of me identifying so strongly with what you say, Derek, because it really, it really makes me emotional when I hear you. And, you know, I think, you know, which is, which is, I suppose where the problem lays, it lays in that, you know, uh, we talk about the Eurocentric imagining faults, that single story, it doesn't allow for different voices. Mm. It doesn't allow for that, you know. And so you're speaking and I hear you. I really hear you, Javon. You know, so I'm not going to dismiss that, negate that in any way. I really hear you. But can I be heard? And I don't mean from you, but can I really be heard? You know, and my understand. I walked into my one of my practices. I got two places, and there was a young black guy sat down there, and he looked at me, and for me, what I felt was it was a, a real terrified look, right? And and then I started to wonder because I saw who his therapist was, and it was a white guy, and I wondered. If we are taught through a Eurocentric lens value system that is being posed and churned out, what is that therapist really doing with this young black guy? It can only reinforce that Eurocentric. And, and this is what program. I was thinking. Mm. And so in the naming or pathologizing, I can now eliminate that if you don't fall into what I think is the norm. Yeah. Yeah, you are, a, and you know, we've been cast as problems from the get-go. I was born, you know, because of, you know, this this epidermal casing, this black skin that I, I, I occupy. From, you know, like I say, 15th century onwards, this has been, been happening and mm. it's within you know, even the idea of primitive or abnormal, that's, that's actually how I have been seen and viewed. Mm. And when I say I, I mean this skin colour, mm. because it's not white. Yeah. And then, you know, it gets, it's more nuanced, it gets more complex, right? Yeah. yeah, but even some of the concepts that we use, you know, we know Freud was a, a blatant racist, even though you know, he came here and he knew what oppression was, but, you know, being a middle, upper middle class, you know, getting success, he, he stared away from that. I think I once heard Freud ask, can a whole race or, or nation of people be mentally ill? He didn't answer that question. He was referring to the, the Germans, you know, and the Holocaust. Mm. He never answered that, but it was more about his success. We also know Young, you know, was a blatant, violent racist. Mm. Yeah, and then we look at other theorists that have built on their ideas, and that story's never been spoken about. We don't talk about that. Yeah, and and there's a lot of pseudoscience that was used to explain the racism, and and I think that kind of except almost white coat acceptance yeah. of information has has got its contemporary roots within the racism of the Victorian age. But it goes back, you know, as you, as you say, it goes back to, you know, before the 15th century. When you look at the, the roots forward and growing and evolving into that psychologically and physically and emotionally aware being that pre, I'd say, 20, 19th, late 19th century, everything was isolated. You know, nations were isolated. 19th century, we start doing a lot more traveling as individuals, not just those few 
merchant traders and and the nastiness that was travel. But we start to see things differently when we get the knowledge on the ground rather than that white coat explanation. What what do you see as the route forward? As I was saying earlier on, and you know, it's it's a long, a very long, you know, uh, arduous task, and that is, and there is a crisis, and you know, it's been, and we're not talking about just locally, you know, just here in Britain, because as we know, these values and these ideas, or ideology, has been globalized through colonization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that is taught, it's kind of reinforced globally. So there are lots of scholars at the moment looking at doing that, as in decolonizing. And it's not an academic uh, a, a kind of activity. You know, there was one author said, decolonization is not a metaphor. You know, and we're talking about land, we're talking about, you know, you saw, you saw the two sides to this you know we've seen it with the pandemic we've seen it with george floyd we've seen it with the queen's uh dying you know mm. it's, it's a lot of work to do but i think i have to do it by myself but not by myself yeah i think you know that idea there's an idea it goes i alone can do it but i can't do it alone or if if you think about the african proverb Ubuntu, i am because we are because we are therefore i am and that's about community and i think you know there are small communities of scholars that actually want to make a change and it does in, it entails because wherever you go within the academia right through to peer reviews journals it is imbued with whiteness mm. that's it and so every area of my training needs to be decolonized whether it's the tutoring and, and i'm not just talking about presentation because as we know there are people of my hue who have actually ingested the, the colonizers if you like values you know so we, we really want to have a critical debate and conversations. There's one author in, in America that says, if we're talking about diversity and we feel comfortable, we're probably not talking about diversity. And so there's a need for that, that discomfort, but also follow up with actions. And I say about this young guy, and as you said, he's being reinforced that actually who he is, how he looks, and if he can find that spirit that is being ripped out, it's of no value. Mm. So is that therapist pointing out, is able to point out those contradictions? And so for me, it's really, I, I, look, I don't come from an academic background I was, as I was moving towards earlier on. Mm. You know, I spent a life in a very dark place. You know, I learned to read and write in my early 30s. I'm in my fourth year of a doctorate course. I work for myself as in private practice. You know, I, I ain't like those clever academic, you know, academics who can spout out rhetoric, you know, and it's really pers persuasive. Mm. That ain't me. And I'm not doing that, what I do for that. Yeah. I actually want to make, which is really cool because my doctorate is by professional practice. That means I need to put it into some kind of practice. Right? Mm. It's not, you know, it's research for research sake. Yeah. You know, so that like, I can get up on the on the listings, you know, and get some status, you know. And, and again, that, that framework of status is shaped, built, and fa has foundations in the very Eurocentric root system of all of that's gone before. How does it make you feel just being in a an academic world of whites? How does it make you yeah. feel? Yeah, I don't think anything I say is original. So let me just put that out there, right? So 
how do I feel? Um, and I just change the semantics slightly so I can take some ownership about me because I can choose not to be there. So how do I feel? I feel, I feel like a space invader. I'm invading that space for one. I feel like an alien in that space. Um, and as a result of finding my voice, as a result of taking that proverbial knee off my neck and speaking up, I've had to go through and feel, you know, and again, none of these ideas or concepts my own, but it, it, I can intuit, I feel it. It's been a battle. It's felt like a battle. One author talks about racial battle fatigue. You know, each time I go to write a paper, I have to go through all this, you know, find some strength. Because part of me goes, just do what they want you to do. Act white, be white, write white. Mm. And then I say, no, no. Mm. And it's almost a contradiction of, of ethical awareness to, to create an environment where an individual has to suppress, and I use the word suppress as a start point. They have to suppress their own identity in order to succeed or proceed in the environment that those conditions dictate that. Yeah. And what we do know is that depression starts with suppression. Mm. And when you start suppressing something, you are pushing it down. You are depressing something that ultimately will boil back up. And we've seen the the end of an era. You mentioned the passing of the late, Her Late Majesty. And there will be those that would go, she was never my queen. I'm one of them. And there would be those that would vehemently hold that, that place in their protection, right? But like the end of any era, anything that has been suppressed during that time period is going to erupt. We've seen it in the Middle East with Iraq, Afghanistan, Iran. You, when you suppress through ignorance, when that suppressing or the perception of whatever is suppressing that is lifted, that's going to come back up. And I think that's what that crisis is that those pressure points that have held that suppression in place for a long time are getting weaker and weaker and weaker. I want to say, I see and I hear what Derek says, and I think because it's, it so resonates in many ways with Irish history, but, but I am white. So for me personally, it's completely different. It's the same, but completely different. It's a complete contradiction. Mm. Because no matter what emotions I feel and think, I can hide them. They're inside. Mm. Whereas when somebody is judged on the basis of their skin, to me, to me, if I'm if I'm really direct, to me, it's just pure stupidity. But I know it goes a lot deeper than that. And I listen to somebody like you, Derek, and I think, what flipping courage you show to be able to stand up as yourself in a very intimidating, because it could be really intimidating environment to feel alone in what you're trying to do against a, the image that comes to my head is like a mountain of white and you. And to me, that makes you somebody that I can't not admire. It's like standing up against everything that you've ever fought for, if you like, which is just to be accepted for you. And I find it so powerful an act that you've taken all your experience, all your understanding, 
And like I said, it does actually tap into something really emotional with me. But it's like watching somebody use all of that and go, I am me, I can be me, and I will accept me for who I am, not what other people judge me on and what, what other people think about me because of a colour. I am Derek McKenzie, and I will show Derek McKenzie for who Derek McKenzie can be and what I have achieved. I remember on that. And I, I, I find that powerful, really, really yeah. powerful. Yeah, I remember standing up pre-pandemic when we had to go into the, uh, the college and the tutor was saying, right, we're going to do it. It's kind of a bit of an experiential thing. And uh, he says, right, and he gets a flip chart. And he start, He says, I'll start. My name is M and his surname started with A. And so he put it up. And then he says something about his surname starting with A. Right. And and what it meant, you know, so, you know, generally on the register, he'd be the first to be called. Um, it, it, the name meant this. Da, 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 right. And. Um, and I thought. Because I, what I'm speaking is, is really the contradictions, what I've been learning to do. Right. And, and, and it's through my lived experience. And I don't think there is one author, whether it's Freud, Young that hasn't, you know, Young, who's his first client? Himself, yeah? And so their experience, uh, they've turned it into some theory, right? So it's something quite personal to them, right? But I remember standing up. I said, I'll go next. And I stood up and I went, well, my name's Derek McKenzie. Derek, I've, I found out, there's a little bolt on an oil rig. Yeah, that's my name, Derek. Mackenzie is my slave name. I didn't ask for it. Yeah, but that is my slave name. And what I experienced then from both black and white is what I've experienced through the whole journey. A deathly silence. Mm. Nobody wants to talk about that. Mm. Nobody. You know, I I you know, there were times from feeling like I, I hated being black, because there was a time, this is what was instilled in me, right? To coming out of that, yeah, and finding out what, you know, like how, how did I get to this place? How did I get to this place of not, you know, <laughs> the thing is even Africa or black, I, you know, we didn't, we didn't come up with them concepts, them terms, no. you know? Uh, who is it? Um, uh, uh, Baldwin talks about, you know, you need to tell me why you needed to construct the word Negro. You know, what did you get from that? I'm not your Negro. And so, for me, it's like, it's really about pointing out the contradictions and all the psychoanalytical, psychodynamic, all those that wanted to. You know, it's about pathologizing mm -hmm. the client as abnormal. It's a language. It's a language for me that, you know, it's, and it's not weighed in any science. So it's, oh, it's no, more it's weighed. This, 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 I'm really glad you picked up on the use of Negro because it's, its root is in Portuguese and a miss translation into English by ignorant, illiterate traders. It's a mistranslation, a misappropriation, a misuse in order to dominate. Yeah. Appropriation is one of the things, you know, I think the West is the greatest in that. But I think, you know, I, I'd also wouldn't just lay the door at the uh you know the illiterate people because i think it's, it's really took and found its strength in those those clever yes the um cambridge um Oxford, oh. <laughs> you know that's where it really kind of took hold and that's where it was really sort of churned out and know? that's where that pseudoscience explanation yeah. which was ultimately excuses to justify an opinion yeah. that was based in ignorance. Yeah.
And when, you know, I, I said before, a lot of that was based in fear. And the fear was being caught out for their ignorance. And they had to suppress any opportunity for anybody to go, your perception is mistaken. Because if that had come out, then their place in the social strata of their world would have been destroyed. And that's the fear mm. that drives all racism is because of that perception of their place within their perceived strata of life. Mm. I'd like to um, suggest something because I think we have approximately five minutes left. I think Derek has, see, all I see is I want more to come from Derek. And I'd like this to be the start of maybe three interviews. But I don't know how you would feel about that, Derek, because you've got so much to say. And actually, I do really want you to be heard. And when you speak, I've said to you, every time I meet you, there's something that you say, there's something that you how you express it, it taps into such a deeply emotional face in me because I do understand what it's like to feel so judged. I do understand what it's like to feel dismissed, but I will never know what it's like to be black. Mm -hmm. And I want more of your information out there and more of your story. And this is just not doing you justice in 40 minutes. So how would you feel right here, right now, we make a decision to follow this up with two more, because I, I think that's, that I need that feels right. Do that, Bonnie. I, I think, you know, given my schedule, I don't think I can commit to something like that right here, right now. Well, we'll sort something out at some point. <laughs> <laughs> I don't give up that easily. I'm a bit like you, Derek. So I hear the word, not right now. That's fine. I can get Listen, back to that. Let me just make something. I, I, I do need to note, right, that because, you know, and it's been there and it's been embedded for so long, These this language, you know, whether it's psychodynamic, um, you know, uh, the naming, you know, within the psych, uh, clinical psychology, that ain't going to get undone overnight. No, it's not. It's not going to happen overnight. But I think there needs to be awareness that what is weighted, what, what's the roots of that? That needs to be, you know, one needs to be aware of that. And also, if you're teaching it, yeah, know that it's a, it's a, a very, it's a language that doesn't speak every language. Yeah, and, and it's how do I how do I navigate that? Yeah, especially if I'm teaching people who are not white Europeans. How do I how do I meet? How do I teach these individuals? Am I going to, like you said earlier on, am I going to continue to groom them? And you know, I think another author, which is not good enough, and just add me to the sentence. Because adding me to the sentence isn't good enough either. Yeah, it's still eliminating that person. How can that person bring their experience, which is what we do as counsellors? Yeah, we are able to conceptualise and we use our own personal experience. But if my experience of no value, what am I left with? You know, you're going to mark me down if I choose not to 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 uh, mimic what you expect of me, or write. Yeah, if I don't take on those values wholeheartedly. If I question them, you're going to mark me down. Or what you may do is you may try to frustrate me because then I'm up against, as you were saying, and what it is, it's the weight of whiteness. I'm up against that. So I'm either going to disenroll, fight, be taken through some kind of policies, whatever you have, yeah? Mm -hmm. Or I'm going to actually be a robot and go through and just want, and just get the paper and, and have no learning at all. Spend so much time, no learning, and then I'm going to have to come outside. What, the question and make it work. And, and you know, I, th I think the, the kind of route that, that 
awareness has to, for me, has to to start with is that for many, many people, what they've been groomed, their whiteness that's been groomed through them means that that perception of mimicking expectation, etc., is in them too. Mm. And they're not, it, it may not be a conscious um, marking down. It may not, it's what that whole historic, for want of a better term, and I'm sure YouTube and Facebook will put a bleep over this, but the BS that goes along with all of that. Mm. I'm, I'm, I question the idea of, you know, as I said, I've not just landed here. I've mm. not disappeared, right? Um, I question the idea of this, you know, this unconscious bias, this, you know, it's there. And I think if you're going to mark me down, you're marking me down simply because you don't understand what I'm writing about. And that, that's what I mean. That's the unconscious. And I, think, and I think, because you know, I don't understand this. There's nothing unconscious about that. I don't understand this, right? And so where does the lack sit? Is it with me or is it with you? But the problem is, is, is that I think that, I, I think that it's that, <laughs> Because it's that single myopic view of the world, you know, that and, and and that's how we're all being taught. And so, in a way, you know, I, re I remember writing a paper, if I'm if I'm of the majority people and you are of the minority being white, yeah, and the new term is global majority, where does the problem lay? Really? Mm. Where does the problem lay? And I and I think, you know. I've been marked down because I cannot critique what you're saying without critique, mm -hmm. you know, and, and then it's personalized. And, it, and again, that comes down to that ignorance of it's that lack of understanding. Mm -hmm. So when that, you know, Eurocentric mindset is groomed into, well, I don't understand it. Therefore, it's ignorant, it's wrong, or it's the, the other. The consciousness of that has already been groomed out because they're only looking at that Eurocentric kind of framework. Yeah, yeah, it's no, very no. cool. I am aware we're going to have yes, to yes, start, but you know what? What really I, I will always openly say because I've worked as a therapist for 20 years, I've heard racism. In, in every single dynamic that you could possibly hear it. You know, children left in hospitals because their skin colour didn't tie in with their sibling's skin colour. I've heard the abuse in relation to internal dynamics of cultures taking place in relation to skin colour. The lighter the child is, mm -hmm. the more acceptable that child is, the more cherished that child is. I've heard horrific stories in relation to the shade of skin mm -hmm. and to me the really sad thing is it is going to take us a long 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 time and it is going to take decades in my opinion if ever to truly truly recognize people simply for who they are not what they look like and unfortunately when you mentioned about earlier, can a whole race have mental health issues? Personally speaking, I think the whole world has mental health issues and it's going to take a blooming long time. And I sadly don't think I'll ever see the day when actually the system and everybody in it is capable of simply looking at another person like a human being. Yeah, none of us has escaped it. We all... Again, another author says, we all breathe in colonality. Yeah, we all breathe it in. Mm. It's, it, it's in the air we breathe. Yeah, mm. no one escapes that. Yeah. yeah. I want to say a massive thank you, Derek, for, for your time. And what, for me, I think, and I'm, Von, I don't know what you think, 
But I think this has been one of the most vibrant and in, insightful conversations that we've done in a very, very long time. But I also think this is one where the CPD validation questionnaire is really going to be be a powerful tool for a lot of people. I wanted Derek here. And me wanting Derek here says it all. If anybody knows me, they know what I'm like. Uh, they know they know what I think and they know what I feel. And if I want somebody here, I want somebody here. So I'm not giving up on follow-ups, Derek. I don't care when they happen. <laughs> I, I, it's, it's because I'm so passionate about how you feel. I'm passionate about what you've been through. I, because I identify in so many different ways but so many similar ways on an emotional level. So I really do, I love the fact that we can go out and have coffees and I've gotten to know this man that has gone from Her Majesty's Pleasure to doing a PhD. Talk about switching the letters around, Derek. You know, it's, 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 it, it's, it just is testimony to a resilience inside of you that I wish everybody had that. Because you've got something that is remarkable to come from a place of not caring about yourself to valuing yourself in the way that you have done. And I say not caring about yourself because that's how you were made to feel uncared for. To where you are, it makes me proud to say, I know Derek McKenzie. And I genuinely, and I think you know me, Derek, mm. in those coffee times. That's how I feel, and that's what I mean. And I thank you so much for sharing. And I'm not giving up on two more somewhere down the line. <laughs> myself. Okay? Listen, thanks, thanks for asking me. You, you know. are more than welcome. One last question. In relation to that anxiety that you felt at the beginning, how do you feel now? Still the same. It's always there. And I embrace it. In which case, accept it, embrace it, uh, and stay yeah. with it. Yeah. Well, for everyone that's watched, if you've gained anything that from, from this conversation that's going to support you and the work you do, then make sure you get a hold of the CPD questionnaire. Validate that experience and get your CPD certificate for this conversation. APA does not give out CPD just because somebody watched the video. It has to have value to you and to the work that you do. That's the only way the confidence in CPD within the public is ever going to increase. So for now, I want to thank Derek, Siobhan for their time, and to everyone out there, we'll see you in another conversation very, very soon.